The first session today is titled The Strategic Challenges of Rebuilding Socialist Organization in the Heart of Empire. And I'm very excited by the brilliant group of people whom we've brought together for this panel. I'll introduce each speaker in more detail before they speak, but for now, I do want to mention who they are and welcome to them to this discussion. We have uh, Andy Sernattinger, Patrick Barrett, and Hilary Wainwright. Um, before providing a fuller introduction, I'll go over the format briefly. Each panelist will be given 20 minutes, after which we will have 60 minutes for discussion. You can share your questions throughout the session by the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And I will also invite questions and contributions from other conference panelists who will be speaking during other parts of the conference. So I ask you to be prepared to come in after the panelists have finished speaking. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Patrick Barrett. Uh, Patrick, as you may know, is one of the main organizers of the conference. He's the managing director of the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he also writes and teaches about US and Latin American politics. He is the co-editor with Daniel Chavez and Cesar Rodriguez of the new Latin American left, Utopia Reborn. And the title of his talk is Party, Class and State, taking a class struggle approach to elections seriously. Patrick, this is Patrick, over to you. Thanks, Patrick. Um, 2020 will long be regarded as an especially significant year in the United States, most obviously because of the coronavirus pandemic, but also because of the wave of strikes among essential workers and the mass nationwide protest against racist police violence. There were also several historical developments on the electoral front, including a record-breaking turnout, and more notably, or notoriously, Donald Trump's effort to reverse his electoral defeat, culminating in a violent assault by his supporters on the US Capitol. But there's a third, albeit more obscure, development that is also worthy of attention, namely the renewed debate within the left over the role of elections in advancing the cause of democratic socialism. This debate long predates the 2020 election, but it has taken on heightened importance thanks to the two presidential campaigns of Bernie Sanders and the related growth of the Democratic Socialists of America. It's this debate that is the main focus of my paper, but the historical background to the right's effort to subvert the 2020 election also figures prominently. I should note that the paper is pretty long um, and the version I'm presenting here is a very abbreviated one. I'll try hard to uh, keep to the time limit, but I may go over by a couple of minutes while also doing some violence to the subtleties of the argument. Um, the bulk of the paper is in response to one perspective in the recent debate, what for shorthand purposes can be referred to as the dirty break class struggle elections perspective, given that it, it is largely responsible for triggering the debate in the first place. Despite my criticisms of this perspective, I regard it as a serious and welcome engagement with the strategic challenges of advancing the cause of democratic socialism. Beyond the crit a critique, uh, the goal of the essay is to contribute to the debate by devoting particular attention to the possibilities as well as the limitations of democratizing the state and the electoral system in particular as a necessary first step in that direction. This in no way um, offers a magic bullet, indeed quite the contrary. Now, nonetheless, I contend that if the left is to take elections seriously and make them a key component of its political strategy, the struggle to democratize the regime that regulates them is a necessary, even if very far from sufficient condition for increasing its capacity for collective action and in particular building a socialist party. It is also essential for meeting the increasingly aggressive political challenge posed by the right. This is especially true in the US where that challenge is particularly menacing and the impact of a more democratic state on the left's prospects would be especially consequential, not only domestically, but globally. Now, the most fundamental tenet of the dirty break class struggle elections perspective is that electoral politics are key to advancing the cause of democratic socialism because as they argue, it is the arena in which the great majority of working class Americans are politically engaged. At the same time, however, they regard the democratic party as a fundamentally capitalist party that cannot be redeemed and they therefore reject efforts to realign or transform it. 
Instead, their ultimate goal is to build a radical independent workers' party. On the other hand, they also reject efforts to launch such a party via an immediate clean break from the Democrats, citing the punishing effects of US electoral law that have thwarted every effort to make a third party viable. Like abstention from the political arena, pursuing such a clean break is to invite political marginalization and defeat. Their solution to this conundrum then is to use the Democratic Party's ballot line to gradually build the forces necessary for an eventual dirty break from the Democrats, a concept first coined by Eric Blanc, the most prominent proponent of this perspective. Beyond the possibility of winning elections, they see the kinds of campaigns this strategy enables as a form of class struggle that will pay important dividends outside of the electoral arena. Now, in assessing this argument, it must be acknowledged that the Sanders campaigns and the victories of Alejandra, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and state and local candidates have indeed generated heightened interest in socialism, particularly among young people and a dramatic growth in the DSA. At the same time, however, the strategy suffers from numerous problems and contradictions, which are too numerous and complex to go into any depth here. These include the outsized role assigned to Bernie Sanders, whose personal trajectory is not only unique, but also inconsistent with the strategy they're advocating. The contradiction between their refusal to sit out fights in the electoral arena for fear of marginalization on the one hand, and their uncompromising commitment to abandon a lesser evil approach and withhold support from any candidate who doesn't explicitly advance a socialist agenda on the other. The apparent belief that the Democratic Party is more alert to and has more power to defeat external threats to its power than internal threats to that power. The lack of clarity about how and when the dirty break is supposed to happen and the lack of historical precedence for this path to launching a working class party. Beyond these problems, there is another problem that I think deserves a bit more attention. This has to do with their understanding of the relationship between social and political power. Rather than a form of unadulterated electoralism, which relies exclusively on the electoral arena, it in fact sees the struggle outside of the electoral arena as ultimately most relevant and consequential. Indeed, it regards the rebuilding of the labor movement as especially critical and advocates a militant rank and file strategy for revitalizing organized labor. On the other hand, however, because of the historical weakness of the labor movement, they see it as, an, as urgently in need of an external stimulus, which is to be found in the electoral arena. It thus amounts to a shift from protest to politics, which is then expected to reverberate or filter back to the benefit of a severely weakened labor movement. Now, it turns out that this is quite, there's quite a bit of confusion here which becomes especially obvious in Eric Blanc's effort to explain the defeats suffered by Corbyn and Sanders and the reversal of fortune suffered by Syriza, all of which he attributes to none other than the absence of a robust workers' movement. From this, he concludes that, quote, the left is caught in an unfortunate catch-22 right now. And as a result, there's, quote, a real danger that the limitation of the turn from protest to politics will lead activists to give up hope or look for shortcut or strategic shortcuts, unquote. The only way out of this vicious cycle, he contends, is to adopt a long view strategy that builds power by combining class struggle electoral work and struggles to democratize the state with efforts to expand and transform the labor movement. This last formulation, I'll argue, actually contains the kernel of a potentially more promising way forward. But it is cast in overly vague terms and remains confused regarding the optimal relationship among these three elements, as well as what might be at the source of their disarticulation. In fact, Blanc's analysis brings to mind the old joke about the drunk man who having lost his keys one night, searches for them not where he dropped them, but a block away under a street light because that is where the light is. This disorienting street light effect or Blanc's feeling of being caught in an unfortunate catch 22 is understandable. It expresses the strategic dilemmas, frustrations and confusion, confusion that come from attempting to reach beyond capitalism while being of it, to borrow a phrase from Leo Panitch and Sam Gindin. <laughs> 
Caught between a severely weakened labor movement and a highly undemocratic political system, the proponents of the dirty break strategy are drawn to the latter because that appears to be where the light is. They understand that the ultimate answer seems to lie elsewhere, but they go in search of it where the searching seems easier. Hence, rather than heightening contradictions as they propose to do, they seem to be pursuing the, the path of least resistance. The remainder of the paper sets out to offer what I think is a more promising version of a class struggle approach to elections. I do this by first engaging in some deeper conceptual reflection on the nature of politics and class capitalist society and the strategic challenges it poses for building working class collective capacity. This includes a discussion of the nature of the capitalist state, as well as the distinct logics of collective action characteristic of capital and labor and those that distinguish social movement building from electoral competition. I argue that a productive articulation between working class movements and political parties thus becomes quite difficult as their distinct logics of collective action pull them in opposing directions. The access to the state that the political arena offers is essential to defending working class interests, but this must be weighed against the risks of subordination to the logic of elections and the co-optation or corruption of the movement's leaders. And while these effects are nearly universal, their intensity will vary depending on the specific characteristics of the state, including the type of electoral regime. In fact, the history of electoral system design has enormous implications for the question of the role of elections in advancing democratic socialism. First, it demonstrates that electoral systems were engineered above all else to block that very project. Second, it shows that the electoral system is not only an arena of political struggle, but also a historically significant object of struggle. Third, it was conservative forces that took the initiative in shaping electoral systems in accordance with their own interests. This took two general forms, single member plurality and proportional representation, both of which were initially devised as safeguards aimed at containing the threat posed by independent working class political mobilization, but single member plurality was far and away the preferred system, while proportional representation was considered a dangerous or risky fallback option. While the nature and intensity of working class mobilization went a long way toward explaining the eventual choice of electoral regime, workers parties focused more attention on the expansion of suffrage than on the design of the electoral regime. This contrast in the approach to elections between the right and their political opponents has remained a major feature of the political landscape in the US, where the contrast is especially stark. In fact, the US represents a wildly successful strategy of containment, which despite waves of suffrage expansion has succeeded in stifling independent working class political mobilization to a degree not found elsewhere. Suffrage expansion began much earlier in the US than in other, er, other early democratizers with the elimination of property qualifications in the early 19th century. But it was also in the US that the idea of using uniform single member districts as an electoral safeguard against the mobilization of workers' parties first emerged. The US political system is highly undemocratic in other respects, most notably the Senate, perhaps the most um, undemocratic legislative body in the world, um, among other characteristics of the US state. Not content with these limitations on the will of the majority, however, over the last century, the right has remained extremely aggressive in pursuing additional electoral restrictions, ranging from measures in the early 20th century designed to suppress the votes of working class people in general and African Americans and immigrants in particular, to more recent voter suppression tactics such as voter ID laws, the purging of voting rolls, the heightened use of gerrymandering, among others, and of course, culminating in efforts to reverse the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. This extraordinarily aggressive posture has not been matched by an equally forceful stance from either the center or the left. This is not to say that popular forces have never taken the initiative in the historical struggle over elections. To the contrary, one of the most significant political struggles in US history has been over suffrage expansion, led most dramatically by the women's suffrage and the civil rights movements. But what those movements won was the inclusion of previously disfranchised classes of individuals within the existing electoral system, not the transformation of the system itself. 
Moreover, the, since the 1960s, rather than meeting the right's heightened aggression with counter, a countervailing move to democratize the electoral system, the response has been overwhelmingly to shore up and defend the existing system. To a considerable degree, the failure to meet this challenge would appear to be rooted in an odd fatalism that infects American politics. The notion that the US electoral system is a permanent feature of the institutional landscape, like an immutable force of nature impervious to change, rather than something that is subject to transformation and thus an appropriate object of political struggle itself. This fatalism infects not only the electorate at large, but also the left, including some of those who argue most strongly for engaging in electoral politics on the Democratic Party ballot line. It does not, however, infect the right. To their credit, Megan Day, Micah Utrecht, and Eric Blanc, the most prominent proponents of the dirty break strategy, advocate democratizing the state as important to advancing a democratic socialist project. But they treat it as at best a brief afterthought and apparently more of a distant long-term goal, certainly not as a central component of their strategy. And electoral regime change figures virtually not at all. In the end then, for all the importance they assign to elections, there's a fundamental way in which the advocates of the dirty break do not take elections seriously enough. It should be noted that there are some exceptions in this larger discussion within D DSA, though no, apparently largely overlooked. Jamal Abed Rabo, for example, has called for making the elimination of single member plurality a central component of DSA's electoral work, arguing that its primary role in electoral dysfunction is a fact, quote, so obvious that the refusal of generations of socialists and leftists to seriously grapple with its implications is quite concerning, unquote. The most obvious of these implications are single member pluralities debilitating impact on the ability to build a socialist party, to forge a productive articulation of left social and political power, and to meet the challenges posed by the right. In the first place, as the right well understood, single member plurality imposes far higher barriers to entry for left parties. Indeed, it's hard to believe that the recent wave of new left wing parties in Europe would have been possible under single member plurality. Moreover, for all the strategic problems that social democratic governments have encountered, we would not even be debating those problems if the very existence of most of those governments had not been made possible by proportional representation. This does not mean that a multi-party system is out of the question, but where alternative parties have emerged under single member plurality, they are typically very underrepresented and or more thoroughly domesticated. Single member plurality also places a premium on building big tent parties with a very broad appeal, which undermines the ability to forge and or maintain a strong socialist identity and orientation while exacerbating the tendency toward electoralism and the disarticulation between working class movements and political parties. Single member plurality has other effects that can serve to heighten the threat posed by the right thereby setting in motion a process in which the most destructive features of electoralism are greatly man magnified and elections become even less fertile terrain for pursuing a socialist strategy. I'm referring to the lesser evil, greater evil competitive dynamic, which has taken a particularly destructive turn in the US, most dramatically in the last two presidential elections. When combined with a heavily skewed balance of social forces, the, the competitive dynamic um, induces a powerful conservative bias to the political system, which in turn fuels a defensive fear and loathing induced short-term perspective that severely aggravates the left's most basic collective action problems. And I, it, it really needs to be stressed that this vicious cycle dynamic is fundamentally systemic in character rather than simply the product of badly motivated individuals or the internal organizational characteristics of the Democratic or Republican parties. In fact, without a move to proportional representation and the establishment of a multi-party system unburdened by the spoiler effect, both realignment and the successful establishment or launching of a third party, whether via a dirty break or a clean break, will likely produce broadly similar outcomes. That is, unless the third party is permanently relegated to minor status. Even if a new left party 
were somehow to succeed in fully displacing the Democrats in a newly reconfigured two-party system, it would likely succumb to the same systemic forces shaping the current Democratic Party and morph eventually into something very much like it. This is because the direction taken by that party has far less to do with the people running it or its internal organizational architecture than with the larger structure of competition in which it operates. If the problem were strictly internal to the party, one might just as well attempt to infiltrate and realign it as to displace it. So if elections are critical to advancing socialism, the regime that regulates them surely matters. Still, while elections may be a necessary component of socialist strategy, they are far from sufficient. Building power beyond the electoral arena is in the end far more consequential as Blanc and other proponents of the dirty break strategy themselves argue. But this brings us back to the question of how to devise a productive articulation between social and political power, especially in the context of a historically weak labor movement. The answer, I argue, lies in the very social and political struggle to de democratize the state as much as it does in the political openings that its adoption would create for the left. In other words, it is the very fight to democratize the state and the electoral regime is the first step in that larger fight that offers the greatest promise of realizing a class struggle approach to elections. This is because of its greater potential, not only for building collective capacity and political experience, both inside and outside of the electoral arena, and for laying the foundations for a genuinely independent political party, but also for heightening contradictions in a way that would raise political consciousness and lead to a shift in the balance of social and political forces. In short, far more than the relatively cautious approach of advocating for working class people by campaigning on the Democratic Party ballot line, it would actually engage people in social and political struggle toward what we could genuinely refer to as a non-reformist reform, which if successful would have the added benefit of widening the left's room for maneuver and breaking free of the strategic catch 22 in which it is currently trapped. And as it happens, the US offers a particularly compelling site for pursuing this struggle. This may seem counterintuitive given the highly undemocratic characteristics of the US state, but is the, it is those very characteristics that would maximize the benefits of a, more, of, of a move to proportional representation, both those deriving from the fight itself, as well as the opening that it would create. That opening moreover would not be limited to the US, but would, be, would also be global in its impact given the imperialistic character of the US state. Now, Identifying the benefits of such a move is one thing. Accomplishing it is something else entirely. But there are several factors that work in its favor. One is history. As, noted, as I noted earlier, one of the most significant and enduring political struggles in US history has been over the right to vote. Tapping into and building on that tradition therefore represents an enormous political opportunity. To date, the, the struggle has been focused almost entirely on gaining and preserving the basic right to vote. But as the civil rights veteran Gwen Patton put it in 1990, quote, we have fought and died for the right to vote, but what good is the right if we do not have candidates to vote for, unquote. The unfinished business of the voting rights movement, in other words, is winning, winning the right to vote for something. This proposition has, if anything, gained greater salience in light of recent developments. Indeed, 2020 represents the culmination of, of a long building crisis making the country especially sensitive to the dysfunctions of the electoral system, and in fact, increasingly open to alternatives as the widespread support for the need for a viable third party attests. 67%, in fact, of the people who indicated shortly before the election that they were gonna vote for um, Joe Biden said that they wanted to have a third party, as did 53% of those who were gonna vote for Trump. The US electoral system is also vulnerable in a rather paradoxical way. While single member plurality discourages voters from opting for a third party for fear of spoiling, it also leaves dominant parties vulnerable to defeat through spoiling. Even more ironic, the threshold one would need to attain in order to spoil is far lower than the plurality needed for victory under single member plurality. In other words, one only needs to win a number of votes greater than the difference between the two dominant parties. Like a strike, strategic spoiling is an act of disruption. 
that is designed to inflict unacceptable costs on one's adversaries, such as they feel that they feel compelled to give in to one's demands. While the Democrats constantly complain about the spoiler effect, the goal here would be to give them not only something to really complain about, but also to meet the means to legislate it out of existence, i.e. proportional representation. In this way then, spoiling can be turned from a tool typically used to discipline the left into a weapon of the left. Another vulnerability is the fact that the design and administration of elections in the US is in the hands of the individual states rather than the central government. States have the power to implement electoral reform at all three levels of government, which can be accomplished either through legislative action or in many states by ballot initiative. This is, that this is possible is demonstrated by the recent example of Maine, which adopted ranked choice voting. This sort of breakthrough can help to generate a demonstration effect for other states, such as has occurred with the legalization of marijuana, while at the same time enabling a new left party to establish a foothold and build strength. Still, the likelihood is that there will be a large number of states that will be difficult to move through these tactics, given the fact that most states can constitute one party strongholds impervious to competition and thus to spoiling. What this implies once again is that these electoral tactics will have to be combined with and in fact subordinated to the kind of activity that has always been the primary driving force behind major social and political change in this country, namely the building and exercise of power outside of the electoral arena. Indeed, we need to draw on the lessons of the 1930s labor movement and the 1960s civil rights movement, as well as the recent strikes by red state teachers and essential workers and the mass nationwide protest against racist police violence. This means making effective use of the full array of disruptive tactics that have proved successful in the past, including nonviolent civil disobedience. But to make the most of such tactics and to go beyond the limitations and setbacks experienced by social movements in the past, it'll be necessary to link them to a concerted and focused struggle to democratize the state, starting with the electoral regime. For in the, for in the absence of such a connection, we can expect to see a perpetuation of the collective action problems and resulting strategic dilemmas that have long plagued the left, while the initiative in shaping the state and the broader institutional landscape will remain in the hands of the right. There's no doubt that democratizing the state constitutes a tall order, but as the recent turmoil over the 2020 election demonstrates, it is more urgent and necessary in, than ever, both to advancing a socialist project and to defeating the growing threat posed by the right. Thanks. Thank you so much, Patrick, for that uh, stimulating paper. Uh, moving to a different part of the world now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Hilary Wainwright, a uh, TNI fellow since 1986. Hilary is a feminist sociologist who works as an independent activist researcher and journalist. She is the founding editor of Red Pepper, a British political magazine. She is a senior research associate at the International Center for Participation Studies at the Department of Peace Studies at the University of Bradford. And she's the author of many articles and books on British, European, and global politics and economics. Thank you, Patrick. And um, thank you, everybody, particularly the organizers. And um, I'm, as Patrick said, I'm part of the TNI, but also I had a wonderful month or three weeks, I think, at the Haven Center. And remember that very, you know, so I'm with great affection, particularly for Eric, um, who, as, as, um, um, Patrick said at the very beginning, you know, he was not only a, a brilliant scholar, but also a really wonderful person. And I benefited from that and, and will never forget it. Um, so I, I particularly want to thank the organizers for um, giving us the opportunity to, to learn lessons from defeat, because it's, it's quite common on the left, at least in the past, to kind of celebrate moments of success. And then when they fail, sort of move on to another great sort of success rather than actually reflect on the sources of failure. And I think that's one reason why we've been slow to innovate. So I'm going to contribute to this discussion um, by sharing some reflections. I wouldn't say definitive lessons, but reflections on the defeat of Corbyn's Labour Party. So a, a lot of what I said, say, um, sort of connects with what Patrick said. 
um, it maybe concentrates a little bit more on the move beyond electoral politics. And I suppose my, um, my although I begin by talking about how the team Corbyn and his supporters, including myself, and in a way, any critical remarks here are self-critical because I was a very enthusiastic um, Corbynista. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I didn't completely lose my critical faculties, but I was very, very um, enthusiastic. Um, but so I think we, uh, I want to begin by talking about the ways in which we underestimated the resilient strength of our former imperial establishment. And we overestimated the extent to which a Labour Party led by Corbyn would be popular. But my main argument concerns the consequences of an emerging transformative politics, new transformative politics, which is what Corbyn's politics was, I'd argue, living inside, struggling inside, you could say in and against an old but institutionally powerful social democratic party uh, body, i.e. the Labour Party, so that in a way, sometimes we, we kind of misestimated the extent to which the the victory at the level of leadership was also a transformation of the party, which it was not. Um, in a way, I felt last night in the really good sessions that we perhaps moved a bit too quickly over the social democratic option. Because, I mean, for sure, and I agree with Danielle and others, uh, it's not a strategic option. But its time has gone in that sense. But I think we need to face up to the fact that it's institutions and accompanying mentalities, primarily it's electoral institutions, uh, but then in a way social democracy, democracy is at its core, a politics allied to representative parliamentary democracy with its separation of politics from economics and its project of using these institutions to redistribute wealth, including the provision of welfare rather than transform production. But those mentalities and those institutions geared to parliamentary politics um, are still there and are still very powerful. And in a, in a sense, that's what the Labour Party uh, is. So these institutions, I'd argue, have certain features that weaken the capacity of a new politics trapped within them to challenge the power of the imperial establishment. In a sense, they too were the product of the imperial state. I'm thinking here particularly about the nature of the trade unions and the relation uh, uh, and their relation to the party that they were uh, the Labour Party is in a sense based on the idea of a a representation of the unions as a sectional interest kind of fighting within um, an imperialist economy for the the benefits of that imperialism so a kind of aristocracy of labor but was a very um, sectional kind. And I want to add the gist of my, my contribution. It's not yet a paper, so it's more like notes and an abstract, which is probably on the website. But the, the conclusion, inspired particularly by the session last night and my own, my own sort of reflections, is the need to rethink party organisation and unions. On, on the basis of new concepts, and I think the concepts that were kind of in the, in the air, as it were, last night, the concepts of productive democracy as distinct from parliamentary democracy, I mean related to electoral democracy, but, but in a sense more fundamental. Um, and the idea of workers and citizens as producers, you know, with productive capacity as distinct from, in a way, the old idea of union members simply as being wage earners. And then also on new concepts of knowledge, which I think, again, um, uh, you know, the, the older concepts of knowledge to do with the exclusive relevance of codified knowledge, it, you know, to the ignorance and marginalization of tacit knowledge, practical knowledge, knowledge often dismissed as gossip or as kind of emotional or as indigenous, you know, that those kinds of dominance of those kinds of knowledge uh, were another feature of the of the sort of imperial um, uh, state and and the idea of simply taking over that state um, is is therefore um, a dead end. But um, let's uh, those are, that's the sort of logic of the paper. But let's start from from the defeat of Corbyn. So 
in a way, starting from December 2019, when that defeat took place. Um, two years after, Corbyn's Labour seemed to nearly defeat the Conservative leader, Theresa May, to the immense surprise and kind of shock and horror of mainstream observers. You know, he, he came, you know, within a very short um, sort of um, amount of votes uh, to actually winning a, a majority position. But the, the, the way in which the, in that, the, the, you could say the British establishment was taken by surprise. Um, it hadn't anticipated, you know, it had complete contempt um, for Corbyn, uh, almost a class contempt, even though he wasn't, he was actually quite a middle, came from quite a middle class background, but, but he was seen as representing the working class in some real sense. And the working class had therefore got a bit too close to power. Um, and, and they were taken by surprise. And, and then in the following two years, um, completely reorganized uh, and went for um, Corbyn in a most uh, vicious sort of way. Um, what I want to talk about is later on is the difficulties of how rebuilding socialist organization post defeat reveals the extent of Labour's Labour Party's structural integration with the, with the imperial establishment, its priorities and its power relations, and the profound challenges this poses for developing the capacity and the consciousness for socialist change. And that's recognizing, I think it was Lucio's point last night about the importance of thinking about um, consciousness. And I want to argue that it's indeed only due to the extreme shock you could say almost disaster socialism is one of the one of the possibilities implicit in my argument. Due to the extreme shock, shock of the COVID pandemic, with its imperative to put health before the continued working of the market, something only reluctantly and incompetently complied with by Boris Johnson here in the UK. That is an opportunity um, uh, that is a ruling elite shaken and partial, partial disarray and an in initial impetus to gain support for practical alternatives to the everyday routines and relationships of capitalism. And I'll give some examples later on. Widespread recognition of the feasibility of socialism and a vested interest in its possibility are, I would argue, a condition for transformative politics, whether we call it socialism or a commons based system. Or, or a word that needs to be reinvented, but I'll call it socialism. Um, so in, 2000, in, in 2017, the ruling elite had relied on conservative leader Theresa May with her 80 seat majority to destroy Corbyn's labor, which it treated contemptuously and with disbelief. On election day, 2017, it was clear that Corbyn and the radical manifesto he championed had awakened forces in British, especially English, society that were simply beneath the political radar of the establishments antennae in their cushioned fortresses in, in London and the home counties. Corbyn, um, sorry, Corbyn and his supporters had mobilized millions of especially young voters who normally didn't even bother to vote and hardly figured in the sophological studies of UK elections. In effect, as a result, the appeal of Corbyn's uncompromisingly radical policies combined with an energetically outward reaching mass campaign, the tactics of which were often learnt from um, the experiences in the US with the Sanders campaign, momentarily broke the predominant electoral um, law of British politics and its one first past the post electoral system, that politics are won or lost in the centre ground. And this had previously been just automatic. And in a way, the achievement of Corbyn at that moment was to show that you can win from the left, but it was a, a kind of overconfident assumption. So without pointing to a concerted conscious plan, it seems the different establishment forces from the Tory party through the press and the corporate and financial elite to the US and the Israeli state made a concerted effort working beyond their normal routines to prevent Corbyn becoming prime minister. They found allies in the parliamentary Labour Party who firmly believed that Corbyn's leadership was a nightmare aberration 
and spent their waking hours doing all they could to exorcise it. Indeed, in 2017, Peter Mandelson, the architect of New Labour and Tony Blair's leadership of the party, boasted without shame, I work every single day in some small way to bring forward the end of Corbyn's tenure of office. So that gives an indication how, how much within the Labour Party um, the establishment was in effect at work. The rise and fall of Corbyn's, Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party and the nature of the problems socialists now face in the UK um, is therefore particularly revealing of the strategic problems of building organisations for socialists at the heart of the old empire. So my contribution will draw on distinctive features, features of the UK, working for socialism in the UK, but I want, will connect with arguments with those raised in the opening session by Gar, Daniel and Joel, and also by Gina, Hina, Lillian and um, Tithi in the inspiring session on feminism in order to suggest their wider relevance. First, I want to just reflect on the challenges for socialists working in the old strongholds of capitalism in the form of a long, the fact that in such long established capitalist countries, market based and profit driven relations of work and everyday living have become taken for granted. All vestiges, all including memories of non capitalist, um, um, sorry, non capitalist relations have been eliminated, except perhaps to a degree in personal relations. But even here, commodity production has spread its suffocating octopoid hold. Moreover, this generalized experience of competition, um, uh, competitive individualized market relations um, has meant that the individualist competitive values that these relations have reproduced tend to be unconsciously absorbed. In these circumstances, socialists tend to be a minority, which is something that we often, you know, forgot, and particularly in the sort of moments of, of apparent sort of surprising rise of Corbyn's politics, we kind of forgot that we were actually deeply um, and, and profoundly a minority. Um, yet, and because at the same time, especially in the past 20 years, capitalism in these countries, like, like in Britain and in the US, appeared so decadent, so riven with crises um, and its grounds for legitimacy, for producing useful goods, creating jobs, generating wealth to fund welfare, had been wi so widely undermined by the monetary priorities of neoliberalism um, and by the imperial aggressions of our states, that disaffection was widespread. And we on the left were tend to, to assume that that disaffection somehow automatically became socialists. Because many of us as committed socialist activists, activists spent so much of our time working with others of like mind for socialist change, we didn't have an adequate sense of what Leo Panitch described as the chasm to be overcome between the scale and scope of the utopian dream and the sheer extent of the stunting by capitalism of working class capacities. This meant there was a gulf between disaffection with capitalism and active support for systemic change, which is what Corbyn's leadership of Labour had come to symbolise. So in a sense, the challenge is how do we build that um, belief and commitment to systemic socialist change um, prior to any or in the course of um, winning electoral success, and almost, almost as a condition for winning electoral success, for sustaining a socialist commitment against the attacks of the establishment. So um, I, I want to look at a number of different um, factors that reinforce the absence of the experience of viable socialism, um, you know, in, 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 in countries, imperial countries, and I'm thinking particularly Britain. So firstly, an important particular possibility of an experience of socialism that prepares the way um, for developing some kind of almost vested interest in a, in a, a solidarity-based system is through local experiments. So different histories and political economies can reinforce or mitigate the, the difficulty, the fact of the difficulties of developing socialist uh, consciousness. 
if common human values of solidarity, um, you mutual respect and reciprocal care are to become the basis of an active commitment to creating a new, new institutions in the face of opposition and vested interests, then people need lived experience and practical proof that such institutions are feasible and worth the effort and risk of breaking from routine normality. Policy statements are not enough. The impetus for such active commitment requires the institutional space for campaigns or actual experiments based on values of solidarity, mutuality and care to flourish, or historical shifts in the balance of power that can create um, breaks in certain spheres of life, for example, health from the logic of private profit. Thus, political and economic institutions that are centralized, as often high, you know, imperial um, states are, and minimize the autonomy of different geographic levels, are, are inimical to the possibilities of socialist values gaining a hold through practical experience of an alternative reality that interrupts the normality of capitalism. A high degree of notably undemocratic and opaque centralization of the state and also finance is a feature of the British political, the British political economy. This is a historic product of its parliamentary monarchy on the one hand, reinforced by the city of London on the other, and its close links with the treasury through, through which most of the country's finances are controlled. The scope for sustained socialist experiment of an institutional form has been minimal. The one time it took root with considerable resources and a high profile, and in its day a significant impact, was in the Greater London Council in the early 80s. But the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Thatcher, deployed the nuclear option of her centralised power and simply abolished, you know, we don't have a written constitution, she could simply abolish that, this elected council, um, a substantial tier of strategic government, unprotected by an explicit constitution. Um, the second you know, possibility is through national breaks from market-driven economics. From a historical perspective, national institutional breaks from previous normalities can also create conditions of actual experience and hence credibility of non-capitalist values and priorities. In Britain, the welfare state, especially the NHS and public housing, created on the basis of no return to the pre to the, the, the pre-war years of poverty and, and, and Ill, Ill health, inspired the precedents, inspired by the precedent of, of wartime mobilization for a public purpose, had such an impact. I mean, Mrs. Thatcher, she, she tried to, to, in her campaign against socialism, tried to, to, to destroy the NHS um, because she didn't, she wasn't relying simply on propaganda, but on destroying what she saw as the experience of socialism in everyday life. She destroyed local public housing through her policy of right to buy, but she was not able to impose a market logic on health. Popular support for the NHS at every level was too strong. It took a Labour government actually to led, led by Tony Blair to open the NHS to the market. So I probably need to speed up. I don't know how much, have I got a bit more time, Patrick? Hi, Patrick. Hope you haven't gone to sleep. Yeah, have you I? have it. No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm listening attentively. You have about three or four minutes. Oh my God. Okay, so I better, um, I better sort of skip a bit. Um, so, I mean, I think what I'm arguing here is that, um, that in a way, that one of the challenges facing Corbyn was that, um, and his movement was that he came to, to office in the Labour Party very, very speedily ex um, expressing um, and giving kind of representation to this disaffected um, and, and, and marginalised youth, particularly precarious workers, but without any of the, um, the, the possibility of building actual experiences of socialism in practice um, at a local level or, or at a national level. I mean, in a way, the exceptions that prove the rule, which as Gar talked about yesterday, of Preston, the local authority that did attempt to use its limited powers very creatively to create the idea of community wealth building, you know, non-profit driven local um, production, 
uh, that, that displaced the, the power and presence of multinational corporations in the locality uh, and created decent jobs and some kind of democratic control over the economy, you know, was, was, was an exception that gave some real practical experience of, of, of non-capitalist value driven, um, social need driven forms of production. And similarly, um, the organization of precarious workers through both independent new unions and the, the older Baker's Union, um, but supported by John McDonald and Jeremy Corbyn, and again, gave a very practical example, but these were exceptions. And, and electorally, Corbyn did well in those cases. But I think, so the lesson of this is that in a way, we, I want to argue about going beyond, um, beyond protest and electoral politics. Um, and so that, in a way, that dichotomy isn't enough. And into the idea of developing um, productive capacity, I get the capacity to actually build transformative social relations sort of in and against capitalism. Um, and I think um, what I want to argue very briefly is that um, in a way the, the pandemic has provided an opportunity for this, that it's shaken uh, the sense in which it's disaster social, well, it could stimulate disaster socialism, is that it's, it's shaken not only the old institutions of the empire um, and the state, you know, look at the, the possibility of the breakup of the British state with Scotland develop, managing the pandemic far more effectively and the, that contributing to the rise of the independence movement in Scotland and in Wales. But also the trade unions have, have in a way, if you think of them as historically institutions that were kind of in a way um, a product of an imperial power, uh, and their sectionalism and their, their treatment by the Labour Party simply as wage earners, not as producers, has begun to change. That, that in a sense, they're both weak, but also they still have a sufficient hold to be important. So in, for example, um, aerospace manufacture, there are some very dramatic examples of where they've become key to the, the conversion of of airplane manufacture to being the production of ventilators, or you've had, um, and, th and that, that tradition is continuing. So there's an openness uh, in the uh, manufacturing unions to, to rethinking their role as producers of use value, not just as wage earners. Uh, and, and on that, um, a left politics could build to try and generalize that kind of um, consciousness. Similarly, the teachers union has, has thought of itself not simply as defending its, its members um, as, as wage earners, as it were, uh, in the schools, but also defending and protecting the, the needs of families, children, grandparents, elder people in the community. So it's become a kind of real voice of, a, um, of the needs driven economy and public sector that we need at this time. So I think it's how do we generalize that and how, and I think this idea, what I wanted to, I began to say yesterday is that this idea of productive democracy in a way points to the basis of an alliance where we, we bring together or socialists, uh, uh, capitalists in bringing together different actors who have productive capacity. Uh, so that means those in unions, but also those in social enterprises or interested in forming cooperatives or, you know, another thing we saw in the um, pandemic was community groups that got involved in, in making masks, making protective equipment. Um, and you can see implicit in that is a recognition of productive capacity within the household. And in a way, the whole implication of, of feminist analysis of, of domestic labor um, have pointed to the productive capacity, um, the creative capacity in the household. And so a lot of the, the pandemic attempts to develop communal food, um, rethink the, the food production and the food chain, uh, I think are very important examples on which to build and to build those kinds of alliances.
but linked to that is the idea of you know, linked to the idea of productive capacity is the idea of of knowledge as being practical and tacit and in a way the idea of power as transformative capacity based on that recognition of of practical knowledge and the importance of sharing that practical knowledge and there the women's movement has provided the most um the most uh, vivid and most in its own terms, effective forms that we must, that the left needs to um, learn from. And finally, because I know that I'm coming to the end of those few minutes, I've probably gone beyond it, but in terms of electoral politics, I think we need to be, to be able to think in terms of the, the real transformative energy and capacity being, being non-electoral, being in the exercise of this transformative productive capacity, but the electoral, um, sphere and therefore the issue of control over this well one dimension of control over the state must be seen as a resource for that transformative capacity building within society and that requires a massive transformation of the state in the direction of both decentralization but also in terms of a democratization of the institutions of the state and that's where the, the lessons from the participatory democracy of Porto Alegre and so on are relevant if they're combined with this notion of productive democracy, which in a way, perhaps that uh, the absence of that productive dimension is, is perhaps the key, one of the keys to the, the failure of the, the participatory democracy model that we saw, saw in Porto Alegre. So I want to, in a way, end by saying that a, a disaster socialism you know, that is that, that, that builds on the way in which our old institutions, including those of the labor movement in the community and the workplace have been shaken, but that it needs to, um, we need from it to build new institutions that recognizing, recognize the transformative capacity of citizens, whether they're in the workplace or in, in the household. Uh, and an electoral politics need to be, in a way, subordinate resources for that kind of um, creative, transformative possibility. Thanks. Sorry for a slightly uh, rambling talk. Thank you very much for uh, for that talk. We're about an hour into today's session, so um, since we want to make sure to reserve time for for a Q and A, this is what happens when you ask interesting people with interesting ideas to speak. It, it uh, tends to run over slightly, but Andy, you're, you will be next and um, let's make sure that we are reserving enough time for the conversation, which is also one of the most productive parts of these sorts of, uh, of meetings and coming together of, uh, of people around a central theme. Um, so, uh, Andy uh, Sernatinger is our final speaker for this uh, session. Andrew is a socialist and leading labor activist in Madison, Wisconsin. He's a contributor to Labor Notes, Jacobin, New Politics, as well as being a member of the Tempest Collective, an online publication that pursues pieces from activists and writers that grapple with the emerging questions for the left in the United States. Uh, the title of his paper is A Return of Socialism in America? Question mark. Let's get the answer. Over to you, Andy. Hey, um, thanks very much. Um, I feel like I'll probably be a little less formal than the other presenters because it's just my style. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do is kind of spend my time talking about uh, about the Democratic Socialists of America and doing a little bit more of like a descriptive uh thing i guess about how dsa works what it's about its arc and then um from there start to talk about like how do we evaluate it and um in doing that i i've got to make disclaimers right like every time anybody talks about anything big you have to disclaim like pretty much everything you're going to talk about and so this is no exception um so first um you know i i'm a I'm going to present some positions that are that are certainly not the dominant ones um, that are reflected by DSA's leadership. So, you know, I'm I'm a partisan in the organization. I've been um, in DSA since 2017. I certainly have my opinions, and I'm sure people will disagree with them. So, I'm not presenting as the um, singular perspective on DSA. 
Um, the second one is that um, DSA is a it's a inherently difficult organization to describe because of its decentralized manner and exception tends to be the rule actually where there's so much that is specific about things happening in different places that um, you can't just like broad brush the entire organization because um, you'll miss out a lot. But that said, you know, there, there is a guiding logic to the organization and there's a coherence, um, but I just need to be able to, you know, explain how difficult it is at times to, um, to, to capture all the dynamics in it. And, uh, and lastly, not to lose um, that people are doing really exceptional work and inspiring things right now. And uh, whenever you offer criticism, you know, I, I want to make sure that I'm not um, invisibilizing all the great things people are doing. All right, so let's, um, let's kind of start by talking about like, what's the arc of DSA, um, which is a kind of interesting, um, like, abnor uh, abnormality in um, US history right now. So um, before the uh, Bernie Sanders campaign of 2016, the DSA was basically an organization that a lot of um, socialists would have regarded as like a kind of socialist AARP, uh, which is a retirement organization that you get mail from. Um, so it, it had about 5,000 members and uh, it wasn't very present as an activist organization. So how does it move from that to becoming an organization of 85,000 members with chapters in every state in the country? Um, the, the main answer for that is, um, it is the interplay of the Sanders campaign in 2016 and the reality of the Trump election. So um, other socialist organizations at the time had all been oriented to um, how the Democratic Party was basically incapable of producing a social democratic candidate or like a genuinely left um, politician that this was like something that was just not possible generally in the United States. And DSA ends up being the only socialist organization that um, embraces Sanders and shares the moniker of, of democratic socialism with Sanders. So um, all of a sudden you have like the rising popularity of Bernie Sanders and then, um, uh, and then people start looking for what is democratic socialism. One of the first things they find is DSA. Um, so that that kind of helped um, rise DSA. Um, but that alone, I don't think was something that was going to just make this organization grow. It also had to have like the, the negative stimulus, which was the reality of Trump's election. So the actual data, when you look at membership data for when does the organization grow, it doesn't actually grow until pretty much after the inauguration of Trump. So the two things work together where you have um, a negative stimulus of people being very anxious about Trump, like not expecting that it, he would have won, even though, um, you know, like Sanders wasn't the candidate in 2016. And then like finding a political home that was available and ready uh, through DSA. So those two things together um, combined in a way that, that started to grow DSA very quickly. Um, so, then uh, let's see what else we have. Um, the, the first problem that DSA kind of encounters is that in 2017, it grows from 5,000 members to 30,000 members by the end of the year, which is extremely rapid growth. Um, much larger than the organization is able to deal with uh, internally. It's not really able to support the development of new chapters in all these bodies, but also DSA um, ends up kind of having to refound itself in 2017. So you, you have an organization that was actually formed in 1982 um, by effectively a right-wing social Democrat. Uh, Michael Harrington is the like, godfather of the Democratic Socialists of America. And his key contribution to politics was uh, the attempt to realign the Democratic Party away from a capitalist party into a party of labor. Um, that was like his, his signature uh, contribution to politics. And it was one that I think uh, was some of the baggage that inhibited DSA from further growth at the time. Uh, 
So at the 2017 convention, DSA effectively has to investigate what are some of the things that make it difficult for this organization to grow. Um, you have like an alliance of socialists, some of whom were uh, were very new around Sanders. You have some that um, you know were okay with the Democratic Party and you know whatever, and then you have a, a bunch that are very critical of the Democratic Party and are are very interested in using this moment to build a new political organism. Um, and what they end up doing is sort of refounding the organization, but not entirely. Um, so the DSA at the time was still a member of the Socialist International, which is like thoroughly a neoliberal organization. Um, and they make a decision to leave uh, the Socialist International. They also, um, they tack left and, uh, and embrace the politics of boycott, divest and sanction, <laughs> which, uh, which start to like signal to people that this is an organization that's, that's not continuing in the tradition that it had been. Um, and uh, the, the last thing is that it, it has a problem where uh, it's not able to, to define a new organizational being. Um, a lot of the politics of DSA in this formative period are considering the problems of organization about how, how do you structure chapters? What's the relationship of chapters to a national organization? How does democracy function inside the organization? And all of those questions are essentially unsettled. Um, that they don't rework any of the internal functions. And so um, to this day, we still have this this very ambiguous relationship and um, and it's still operating off of a kind of nonprofit model that existed through the early DSA of the 80s and 90s. So um, democracy continues to be an issue where um, there's not room for, uh, for member referendums or, or participation in the national direction of the organization. These are all still kind of controlled by, uh, by a national leadership, which acts as a board of directors. Um, so I think uh, we, can, we can start to look at that period after the initial refounding in 2017 as an experimental phase where um, the organization has come together based off of this agreement that there's a significance of the Sanders campaign. They're anticipating a second round of, uh, of a Sanders run, it, like to be 2020. But in the meantime, what do they do? So, uh, and I say they, even though I'm a member and I participate in all this stuff, but you know, whatever. Um, so there's a lot of experimentation that begins with um, direct action. Um, there were a lot of things directed at Trump with uh, the Muslim ban and starting to create um, airport protests against um, against the Trump administration. There were um, ICE detention that had gained a lot of national attention uh, for child separation. Um, DSA had put together some protests and started some public confrontations of politicians. Um, so in this period where they're not sure what they're going to do between you know, the first Sanders campaign and the second, uh, there's a kind of throw everything at the wall and see what sticks approach. Um, that changes significantly in 2018 with the election of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, which starts to really root DSA more and more into an electoral approach. Um, not not that elections were not important or something, um, but elections start to become the dominant logic of the Democratic Socialists of America and other, other projects start to become kind of subsumed within that. Um, and you'll, I think that you find after that, that, um, that there is this, this sense among a lot of DSA members that, um, that what they weren't sure was possible, can you reproduce a Sanders, becomes a sort of um, a guiding solution for everything, right? Is that there's uh, a previous obsession kind of with, uh, with the sense that social movements aren't making gains. And if they're not making gains, it must be because of social movementism. 
and they kind of bend the stick hard the other direction and say that now everything has to be uh, about gaining power through the state. And I, I think it is significant. Patrick mentioned uh, the phrase from process to politics. Uh, and, and that phrase actually has its own history, right? Because it's, it's Bayard Rustin's argument against the civil rights movement, staying in the streets and arguing to move into the electoral arena. Um, so that those sorts of logics also um, become very prevalent in in uh, in the democratic socialists of America. Um, and then lastly, when uh, when the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2020 takes off, um, then you see like pretty much all of this other activity starts to close out. That um, that the Sanders campaign becomes the dominant logic, and that. Um, everything that is spotlit by the national organization has, has a very electoral focus, that these are the things that, that consistently are, are highlighted by, um, by chapters in the national organization and receive the most attention and most funding. Um, so that, um, that's kind of my descriptive uh, portion about, about the Democratic Socialists of America. Now, uh, when we're talking about like what are the challenges for building a socialist organization in the empire, um, I think uh, we can talk about five, but I'll, I'll focus on three. I think what those what I would say those are is one: a socialist organization has to be rooted in the class, and it has to be um, developing militant class struggle. Um, two is uh, it has to be actively anti-racist and combating white supremacy. Three. Uh, it has to develop independent political expression. And then the other two that I won't touch on so much are it has to have an internal democratic organization and it has to be able to, to some extent, resist state repression. So this has been a consistent historical task through the 20th century, right? Where um, the United States being rooted in slavery um, and and a defined racial order, socialists actually have to actively take up anti-racism as an important uh, facet of, of building a socialist movement and have to be able to organize the class and develop institutions where, um, where they either don't exist or are, are incapable of, of rising to a lot of the task, right? I mean, uh, we usually point to the 30s where we talk about the development of the CIO and um, and, and having an enormous uh, effort going into organizing workers um, at the point of production, but also beyond it. Um, and independent politics, I think, would be the last one I touch on, which is, are you able to create a political representation body for, for um, the working class and the oppressed? Um, which consistently has has been a challenge, as Patrick talked about. Um, I think if we evaluate DSA in in light of all this, uh, what we find is is kind of some murky territory. Um, it, it's it's not entirely clear where the organization has fit into into these tasks. Um, the one that I think is most prominent is um, is DSA's anti-racist record, where it's true that um, it focused early on uh, about combating ICE and immigration detention, but in the face of the largest protest movement in the country's history this summer with Black Lives Matter, the organization largely was silent about uh, about how to relate to this enormous mass movement, and it didn't have direction for membership about how to get involved or the priority there. Um, so that, that becomes a, an enormous challenge, um, is that, is the organization mobilizing its members in this way? Um, in terms of talking about class struggle and, and being oriented in a class also, um, you have uh, a kind of interesting demographic issue within so, uh, Democratic Socials of America, where uh, part of the reason why it's been able to grow so rapidly is that the barriers for entry are, are so incredibly low. Um, you pay 60 bucks, you sign up on a website, boom, you're a member, right? Anybody can do it. Um, and that allows people to sign up very quickly, but it also favors a, a certain kind of person that is going to just want to join something, right? So there's a way over representation of like professional, uh, you know, 
middle class men, right? Uh, it's almost exclusively young people, people under 40. Um, there's, you know, some older people, but it, it, there's a large generational representation. So it's not like DSA is not a, an organization of the working class or something like that. It's a, it, it represents a certain segment, right? Um, and being able to uh, to consider how it's able to change its membership is based off of this problem about how do you in, uh, recruit members and and um, and actively solicit membership, um, and that you know a lot of that is about what you do, right? What you do is going to be how you um, how you bring new people into the organization. Uh, the major weakness that we notice then is that. Uh, is that for an organization of 85,000 members, it consistently punches below its weight, right? That uh, you'd think that here we have, um, you know, a, a right-wing mob that takes over the Capitol and then is, is claiming that it's going to have armed presence at every Capitol in the country, that the largest socialist organization with a presence in every state in the country would be able to say, like, let's organize counter demonstrations. That doesn't exist, right? It, it doesn't happen. And so we have to kind of ask ourselves, like, what sort of organization is this? Um, it's it doesn't have a labor policy either. Um, there is a labor body called the Democratic Socialist Labor Commission, although it sort of abdicates its role as a national uh, coordinator of a labor project. This all becomes localized, for better or for worse. And the last thing I think um, on this is really it, its legacy of independent politics, um, which uh, which is extremely complicated, but um, you know, here we, the, the dominant tendency, I think, um, and I, I'll, I'll kind of disagree with Patrick's analysis on this, is that yes, it's true that class struggle elections um, is officially the perspective of the Democratic Socialists of America, and that it, and it officially speaks to a desire to form an independent party. But if you look at the practice, um, almost none of the things that are, go into electoral campaigns usually embody the strategy that it's claimed to to create, right? That um, there's a set of conditions about openly identifying as socialists, not reinforcing the Democratic Party, um, you know, running as like a movement campaign that's promoting movements. These things are generally not present in DSA electoral campaigns. What you find instead is a kind of accumulation of uh, progressive forces, right? That uh, that like the association with DSA, and that's largely because DSA has a lot of bodies that are willing to door knock and canvas um, and, and to help get uh, get these people elected, right? But they don't usually consider themselves uh, members of the organization that are bound by its decisions or that have a large stake in the pressing questions about socialism. Um, so the de facto position of DSA is actually run in the Democratic Party and discourage independent politics because they believe that independent politics um, is counterproductive. Um, these, I think, ask us to say, like, what, where are we at? What is the potential of, of DSA with so many members, but a practice that's very uneven? Um, it has a lot of potential as an organization. I wouldn't be a member if I didn't believe that it did. But I think that what we find is that um, a lot of its guiding assumptions are, are very social democratic. Um, they, they have an electoral logic that dominates them. Um, and that its relationship to social movements is usually based off of, uh, is this going to aid a election campaign or an alliance with other forces in the pursuit of accumulating those forces, right? Uh, and and that's, a, that's a very tenuous position to be in, right? Uh, that you're, uh, you, you actually haven't built your own block and you're not attempting to do so. That DSA, when it tries to put out national actions, doesn't usually instigate them. They look for coalition work that another actor that they believe is uh, like a socially legitimate force leads and that they lend their legitimacy to DSA. Um, I think that, you know, we can get into the reasons for why that is. Um, but it does underlie a kind of cynicism or lack of confidence in the ability of democratic socialism or a socialist organization to, to lead and to be able to have uh, pertinent things to say, right? Um, 
so you know these are these are consistent challenges that I think uh, a socialist organization is going to have in the United States, um, and and things that we have to take very seriously. Um, I think that you know there there is very much the capability to address these things, um, but. It, to me, it's an open question about about whether that will be resolved in favor of the electoral logic or whether it's going to be able to to kind of take up some of these historic tasks um, in challenging white supremacy and building class institutions and trying to set out it, um, an independent representation. So thank you. Terrific, thank you very much and right on time. Um, that was a great start to, to the day. Uh, before I take questions that you have been sending in, I'd like to first ask if any of the other conference participants would like to ask a question or make a comment based on the presentations we've just heard. So if you would like to do that, um, simply turn on your, your, your camera and raise your hand and you can, uh, you can ask a question in that way. So Hillary has a question. Hillary, go ahead. Since I've spoken, I don't want to take up space, but just to make connections. I mean, it's really to Andy and, and Patrick in, in a way. Um, so, I mean, I, this and to make the connection with the Corbyn phenomenon. So this point you make, Andy, about how um, the electoral um, dimension became dominant. Um, you know, is very much echoed in in our experience here because, you know, the, in a way, momentum, which kind of I don't know, it's not the equivalent of the DSA, but it's a kind of radical. Um, well, it, it it was really the consolidation of the campaign for Corbyn uh, turned into a lasting organisation, and it's at its foundation, it was very much committed to a sort of combination of the electoral and the extra parliamentary but um as in the us what you call the electoral logic um took over i mean in our case uh it was after the um corbyn um led party did so well in 2017 that it, it you know its leadership presented itself as being and saw its job as being to show that it was like a, a government in waiting and in a way, I, I, I was culpable in this. I mean, I could feel, yes, you know, we're, we're, we're legitimate, we're there, you know, we just got one more push kind of thing. And, um, but yet, you know, as I've argued, you know, it, the electoral logic isn't sufficient because there isn't actually that sort of majority support for systemic change. There's majority disaffection with the existing system but not that commitment to systemic change. And for that one needs um, another logic in a way. I mean, it's interesting you talk about electoral logic because the problem is that in a way the extra parliamentary struggles, whether it's rebuilding class institutions or in a way the anti-racist struggle, which is kind of related to the building of new class institutions because those new institutions have got to be, you know, have anti-racism built into their into their very being. You know, the old class institutions are the product of imperial um, power. You've got to recognize. And so, what is the other logic? What is the logic that we've got to develop um, so that the, uh, as it were, extra parliamentary dimension has equal um, or or perhaps greater? Because I think we can all three agree on the sort of primacy of the extra parliamentary. But what is what is the logic there that can withstand the kind of powerful logic of electoral politics? Maybe that's a question to both Andy and Patrick, because it also implies the basis for then transforming the electoral and, politi and, and political system. Should I just respond? Yeah, you go for it, Andy. I think um, I, I think here the first thing is that uh, that there is a kind of um, what do you call it uh, 
like a seductive nature of of the 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 Sanders moment or the Corbyn moment, right? That like people felt like, oh yeah, well like this is the thing we're doing it, right? And uh, and and I think it led to a major overestimation about what this moment was. So uh, for one, I think we do have to be very sober about about what what the Sanders moment was. Uh, which in some ways was a, you know, a, a historical anomaly or something like that, right? Which I'm, I'm not using that to say, oh, you know, back to the old stuff, just like swipe this away. I, I, what I'm saying is like, I think that it, it did actually produce among a lot of people this idea that all we have to do is this. This is like the golden ticket, right? We just do that and we're good. Um, and I think that uh, it also produced a, a sense of like stir from the top, right? Like Patrick discussed that uh, part of the analysis of like a dirty break or, or any of these like electorally minded things is, is actually a massive cynicism about the, the capacity of people to act on their own and for class struggle to be successful and, and uh, transformative, right? Where if you believe that the labor movement is so backwards or whatever, it, it's sort of like um, a, a self-fulfilling thing, right? Which is like, well, can't do it. Um, it whereas I think we, what we need to do is, is flip that on its head, right? Which is to say that we do need to build those as, uh, as, the, as important um, institutions and that those are the basis of a political representation that you, you can't um, fictitiously invent a political representation and like you know, I don't know, you're not going to get this in the UK, but throw a Hail Mary, right? And just be like, boom, end zone, we got it, right? Like, uh, it, like there is a lot of very difficult work that goes into there. And, and, and I think that what we have to, to be able to do is really embed the electoral work into social movements and labor struggles, right? That uh, right now, rather than them being embedded, they're seeing as substituting, as being able to create activity where it doesn't exist. And that I think is, is the real downfall of, of that electoral logic, right? Um, it also, when I was talking about who does it entice in, in class terms, right, it, it does tend to, uh, to bring in a déclassé kind of element because their, their entire perspective on how social conflict works tends to be through electoral means in the first place. I'd like to jump in on there too. Um, I mean, I wholeheartedly entirely agree with what Andy just said. Um, and the use of the word seductive is appropriate because um, it, it is the case that I think that there are, I mean, it, I didn't have time to go into it. I, I spent some time in it, on it in the paper, but that there are very distinct logics of collective action between, um, between building a movement, a social movement, and, and engaging in electoral politics. The electoral politics are far more seductive because it has a sort of very defined and narrow objective and time frame. It's like we, we have to organize around a, an event, a, a date in early November. We get enough people to vote for this particular individual. And then, you know, hopefully that person wins and assumes office. I mean, building a social movement doesn't have that kind of like, okay, there's a defined date at the end of which you're gonna achieve your objective. Um, instead, it, it depends on a whole heck of a lot more um, dialogue and building deep relationships. Um, the claim that the people who are in, you know, put so many of their eggs in the basket of electoral politics, despite the fact that they want to resist the label of being engaging in electoralism, is that they can actually uh, sort of achieve that same kind of deep set of relationships and, in fact, have them spill over into these other arenas outside of the electoral arena. And that's why. Um, these folks will claim that, for example, the, the victories of the teachers' strikes in these red states was, you know, largely due to the inspiration of Bernie Sanders, when that's a very hard and disputable case to be made. Um, but it's, 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 it's also the case that, um, you know, that they make this claim that elect, the electoral arena is the place where most working class Americans um, fine politics. Uh, you know, it, it, it's based on this assumption that, pol that there's a certain narrow definition of what is politics. I mean, I would make the argument that life in general is political. Every arena that we live in is politicized. 
And the space that people, working Americans spend most of their waking days um, is not the time at which they engage, they go into the voting booth, but at work um, and in their communities. So it, it's the case that it's so much harder, uh, because, particularly because of the nature of the difficult collective action problems that, that distinguish working class people, particularly from property, the property classes or wealthy people um, that make that work really make that makes that work really hard and with a long term sort of commitment. Um, and so elections just, just seem like that's why I use that analogy of a drunk man looking um, searching for his keys where the light is because it's it draws you there uh, thinking that it, it seems easier. And it's ironic that again, you know, that somebody like Eric Blanc, who's a very in, highly intelligent person. I mean, I have great respect for all of these people, but their, their argument is sort of riddled with contradictions. And, and, and actually, just to respond to what a, a comment Andy made, we actually don't disagree on the, what the point you thought we disagreed on. I, I didn't have time to go into it, but there is a, a, a huge contradiction between their refusal to stay out of the electoral arena or their commitment to say that we can't stay out of these, these fights because that's where most Amer working class Americans get politicized um, on the one hand because of their fear for uh, being marginalized politically, but then they, they state this uncom supposed uncompromising commitment to abandon the lesser of evil approach um, and withhold su support for any candidate who isn't a socialist. Um, when in fact, what that means is they're gonna have to stand down on most elections uh, because the number of races that have socialist candidates that are explicitly describing themselves as such is very small still as a percentage. And then even in those cases where they lose, what happens to, in the primary, what happens then? If, they're, if you're going to not stay out of these fights, you're gonna to have to embrace a lesser evil. So there's, and which in fact de facto is what occurs. Um, so there's a huge contradiction there. Um, but the, again, uh, elections have an entirely different collective action lot in the United States, uh, given the nature of our very undemocratic political system, which exacerbates the difference between movement building and elections. Okay, I think Mike and Pete have questions. Why don't we take both of those questions, get quick answers to them, and then I'll bring in some of the things that people have posted in Q&A and chat. If you're listening and you have a uh, you know, question occurs to you, please enter it into the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Uh, thanks so much for those presentations. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay, great. Um, I don't know that I disagree with Andy and Patrick, but I think I have a different perspective. And I wanna, I wanna pick up on a point that Hillary made, which I think is crucial for this conversation. And that was the point about overestimating the popularity of Corbyn um, and a similar overestimation of the popularity of Sanders here in the US, kind of expecting him just to kind of take the nomination, no problem. I think that, I think that points to something. It points to the fact that organizing um, isn't simply about reflecting the interest and ideas that people already have, but it's also about shaping those interests and shaping those ideas and, and bringing people around a common perspective. And, and historically, the role of labor unions and the role of political parties has been just that, not simply as to, to exist as arenas in which you have coalitions that already have set interest and set ideas and you're kind of just, you're just reflecting what they want, but actually shaping shaping people's perspectives, trying to build people, build up organizations around a common perspective. And if we, if we, if we kind of think about, if we think about organizations as having that basic purpose, which gets to the question that Patrick was, was, was pointing to about collective action. Collective action isn't simply about getting people to go to a protest. It's about getting people to have a shared common perspective in which they would want to go to a protest in the first place. Then then actually the um, what we've seen, I think, um, with uh, running candidates, what we've seen with the the teachers unions, um, the 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 um, defund the police, Black Lives Matter protests, 
has been, I think, profoundly successful in that, in that we, we are getting the emergence, um, at, least in, at least in advanced capitalist countries like the US and the UK, of a new socialist perspective. That the, the, last, the last several decades, we have been totally marginalized in terms of uh, our role in popular politics. And if we, if, we, if we look at sort of, you know, the U.S. since the, since the financial cri crisis of 2008, we've, we've seen a, a deep delegitimization of the, the hegemonic uh, ruling class. And, and what we're seeing right now, in my, in my view, is the sort of the complicated, messy reorganization of class interest around different poles. That, that can be the far right. That can be, you know, maybe moderates. That can also be the the um, uh, socialist left. And if we if we kind of have a perspective of, look, we're in a messy period in which we're trying to organize and trying to build common perspectives. It seems to me that, given all the limits of running people in elections over the over the past few years, and all the the deep contradictions and deep challenges that it involves, we've actually been really successful at building a new perspective, a new perspective that says, we should defund the police, we should fight for Medi Medicare for all. And so I would, I would just point that out as a, you know, as a maybe, maybe a little bit more of a positive angle. Um, I did have a question of a very, I'll be very, very quick because I already spoke too much, but I have a very brief question for, for Patrick. It seemed like the upshot of the talk was to say that, okay, if we're gonna be, if we're gonna be organizing in, in politics, it should be about getting proportional representation um, instead of single member uh, plurality districts. That should be like the object objective. Um, and that's a way to sort of bring politics and protest together. Um, I don't know, I just, I found that a bit odd because it, it because there are no popular protests in the US right now for changing the electoral system, right? There are popular protests for defunding the police. There are, there's popular organization and mobilization for Medicare for all. There's, there's, there's popular um, organization for a lot of other, I think, important issues. So I, I would, I just, I guess I was a little confused as to how that is going to link up politics and protests. It seems like making that an objective um, would in fact make, make it even more electoral, more detached from popular movements. So anyway, that's just a question. Thank, thank you uh, so much though, those are, those are great presentations. Pete, why don't you ask your question and then we'll turn things over to the panelists. Sure, thanks so much. And thanks to all the panelists. I think this has been a really, really interesting uh, discussion so far. Um, so a, a point and a question basically. I mean, the first thing is that Andy mentioned um, that perhaps the electoral strategy is something, you know, the electoral moment has been something of an anomaly. I mean, I think though that to, if it's been an anomaly, it's been a global anom anomaly, uh, because it's not just been in the US, it's not just been in the UK. We've seen this, at least certainly throughout Europe and in Latin America, primarily more over the previous decade. But it speaks to this problem that the reason that the electoral strategy seems seductive, and incidentally, for anyone that's actually ever been involved in an election, it's really not very seductive. It's like the most horrible thing to be involved in in the world. But it, it speaks to the fact that at the end of the day, people have anger and huge grievances, but they don't have the confidence to take action at the point of production. And they don't uh, have the same level of confidence that through social movement activity, they can achieve uh, their aims. Now, outside of the Black Lives Movement this year, we just have to unfortunately accept that in terms of protest numbers, number of people participating in protests, over this last decade, it's been down on the previous decade. Uh, and so what many people at one point referred to as like an age of mass movements, it doesn't really feel like that age anymore. Now, I appreciate that there are certain instances, particularly, well, France in terms of the yellow vests, the US this year in terms of uh, the movement for black lives are exceptions. And so, you know, the point, though, is that it, uh, it there's a high degree of variation. Um, and so the question then is, and I think, and this, this, this brings me on to the question, which is, Andy, you talked about embedding a, the electoral strategy inside social movement and trade union activity and so on. I suppose I'd like to ask, and this is to everyone, what does that actually mean at a more concrete level? Because I think it's absolutely right to say we need to look at the articulation between social movement activity uh, and between elect the you know electoral politics, party building, more formal 
you know, uh, political strategies and, and so on. And I mean, I think though, and this, is, this just uh, carries on from one of the points Mike made, which is I do think that to some extent we have to change what we consider our metrics of success to be. Because if it's the case that we thought that Corbyn could win and Sanders could win and somehow we would start transitioning towards something like socialism, then we were always going to be disappointed because the structural barriers against them actually having any real success were so outstanding that it was never going to happen. Having said that, though, if we think that the role is simply to use uh, that strategy in order to build up socialist infrastructure in an extra parliamentary level, uh, you know, the general infrastructure of dissent that's been so atomized, to me that is a metric of success. And another one would be, I mean, if we were actually able to win an election, or we're actually able in some ways to use a state apparatus just to change the rules of the game in order to make organizing easier at a molecular level, even if you get voted out a few years later, if you're able to impose certain limits on capital's ability to collectively organize and loosen uh, the prohibitions on labor organizing, I mean, to me, again, that would be something that I would consider a huge success. And ultimately, that's, to me at least, would, be as, would have been the main goals of a Corbyn administration, a Sanders administration, and so on. And obviously, we're not going to get those things. But basically, the point is, I think that we have to think, what does it actually mean if we participate in electoral work, what do we actually think of as success? How do we actually measure that in a more realistic manner in terms of our overall aims? And what does it actually mean, that articulation between uh, electoral work and, uh, and extra parliamentary work? Great. Uh, panelists, let me, can I give you collectively five minutes so that we have time for another round of questions? Sure. Should I go first and respond to Mike and then maybe I let Andy respond to Pete? Is that a good division of labor? All right, well, I mean, so I'll try to be quick. Um, I mean, I think that Mike's question is really important um, and on point in many respects. Um, let me just say that, uh, let me respond to the portion of it that had to do with like, he found it odd that I would focus on proportional representation as a solution, um, given the fact that there's no groundswell for that or no nothing on the order of what might be like you know, the mass protests against police violence. Well, that's certainly the case. Um, my, I guess my point is uh, uh, addressing this is that I, I'm taking the, the dirty break folks on their own terms and trying to analyze that or respond to it both logically and on the basis of the reality that I see in this country. Um, and so to be strategic in, to my, in my estimation is to think about, you know, where do you want to go? What is your ultimate objective? And where are you now? And then from there, how do you get from here to there? Which entails understanding the lay of the land, the set of obstacles into your way in order to get from where you are to where you want to get. And the highly undemocratic character of the US electoral system and of the US state is just an extraordinarily huge obstacle that if we don't attend to it, we're not gonna get anywhere in, in, in the pursuit of the goals that we've identified, including those that seem to have much more of a groundswell of support for, and like the demands to defund the police, et cetera. That's not, those aren't gonna happen uh, under the current regime. Um, unless we, you can't use a system that is designed to prevent change unless your objective is to change the system itself. So that is sort of my underlying premise. And in addition to that, I think that um, I would disagree to a certain de a large degree with it, your characterization of like, this is just sort of like, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but kind of out there and something that nobody could relate to when in fact um, there's deep, deep, um, disillusionment with this electoral system, um, which is sh shows repeatedly over and over again in polls that people find that the electoral system is dysfunctional, that they wanna see third parties. Um, again, I cited the figure 67% of those who in indicated that they were gonna vote for Joe Biden wanna see a viable third party. Um, even a majority of those who voted for Trump, not to mention which again, it, it would tap into one of the most important um, movements in this country's history, 
uh, the, the, the voting rights movement. It's just taking it to a new level. And then finally, to ignore this, to just sort of say, well, people aren't into it, um, is again to sort of cede the ground to the right, which is really into it. The right is just constantly working on this. Um, and that demonstrates that this, in fact, is something that not only can change, does change constantly um, for the worse. And for us to say, well, you know, we should just sort of have protests, which I myself thoroughly support, but without a connection to democratizing a state which creates this very low institutional ceiling that historically has prevented these mass movements that have in fact been the most important in driving change from driving change even more than they might have in, a, in the presence of a less um, undemocratic state. You know, it's our task to sort of take it to the next level. And, and, and then I'll just finally conclude with saying, I didn't mean to downplay the positive things that have developed. Um, I just think that for them to be built upon and taken further, um, we need to do a lot more and draw lessons. I mean, this is one of the points that these dirty break folks want to emphasize is the importance of heightening contradictions so that people realize how undemocratic the system is and then draw conclusions about what needs to be done next. And that, in my estimation, has a lot to do with what would make put meat on the bones of Sanders' call for a political revolution, in fact. All right. Great. So, I mean, I think Patrick just explained why um, why I gave all my disclaimers about, you know, people doing so much good stuff and all that. Um, but, you know, like one thing that occurred to me, Mike, when you were asking your question is that you sort of actually answered it when you had put it in the frame of shaping versus reflecting um, who's going to, you know, like maybe this isn't a popular demand right now, but then again, you were talking about how does an organization or a labor union shape the, um, that popular consciousness and start to create those demands as well. So I think that that is actually one of the tasks um, that comes up in there. And I don't think that delegitimization on its own is, is um, it does, really doesn't do anything, right? I mean, like most people are very realistic about how little they think that you get out of voting. Like, I mean, that's why like half of people don't vote pretty much. And especially workers don't vote because they're like, what's the fucking difference, right? So I, I think um, I, like the, to me, the thing is, is that you have to have an alternative of some kind. You have to have something for somebody to do with it. So right now, the fact that there isn't a, a, a you know, an ability to make those changes or there's no legitimate, you know, reform that's out there. Well, yeah, nobody's going to talk about it. But, you know, if that was something that was produced, then I'm sure it would have, you know, some support. Um, you know, to Pete's question, I think that, that this is also one of the structural things here, right? Like, what does it mean to embed? The actual um, structure of elections in the United States is very much meant to individualize candidates entirely, right? Which is, um, you know, 100 years ago, parties were the place where you had to join in order to have a primary about who would be the candidate, right? When we went to nonpartisan primaries, it effectively eliminated all of the ability of, of political parties to determine who was going to field the candidate. Um, and so it took away a lot of the accountability that a, a candidate would have to their party. And it took away the competition that would exist from the left. I mean, it's not for nothing that, you know, the Socialist Party had you know, mayors and sheriffs and all kinds of things, right? I mean, they competed against Democrats and Republicans on a partisan basis. Given the success of that, they changed it to be nonpartisan. Um, so I think that it means it's going to be a political project to embed. Um, you know, like right now, any candidate could basically just say, um, hey, I'm running. I don't really care whether you like it or not. Um, give me your money. Um, yeah, I promise I'll do all the things you say. Oh, it turns out there's nothing you can do if I don't do that because I'm in office. I'm not accountable to you. I mean, this is sort of the problem. I mean, like, you know, everybody loves AOC. That's great. Like, but, you know, when she votes on something in a way that people in DSA don't like, DSA has no ability to say, okay, we're sanctioning you and, you know, the party's not going to sponsor you or whatever, because that doesn't exist in the United States. So I think that, you know, it, it's going to create a political culture where you do have to start to set some kind of rules and norms for how you're going to run elections that, um, 
you know, that is going to have to be the function of the organization to enforce in some ways, right? And that means that you're going to have to create negative consequences when somebody violates that. And I think that's something that we've been very reticent to do. Can I just say something quickly, um, Patrick? Please, so, go ahead. Uh, in response to Peter's uh, point, which seemed to apply to, in a way, both Corbyn or Britain and the UK. So this embedded and the US, so this, in, this issue of embeddedness, and this, there have been, besides Black Lives Matter, sort of mass mobilizations. I think what I was trying to say is that actually the, the, the nature of the, the, the struggle in society is, no, is not at the moment taking a mass form. I mean, it might, you know, obviously the COVID situation makes that more difficult, but not, doesn't preclude it. But, but on the other hand, there's a lot going on. And I think in a way, it's really important for, for socialists to, to spend more time sort of actually investigating, listening to kinds of resistance and organization that, that exist in everyday life. I mean, one, just to give an example, I mean, one feature of the kind of people joining the Corbyn movement um, included people who were quite rooted. I mean, in my area, Hackney, one of the people that joined was very involved in her tenants organization. And maybe this is more true of, of women, but, and, and, and the result is that she's been um, supported by the Labour Party or local Labour Party people in developing that. And she's gained her own confidence and thought of that organization more and more politically. It's now got quite involved in a whole lot of initiatives around COVID, She's continued her involvement in the Labour Party, but not made it her prime involvement. So electoral politics isn't sort of dominant, but is is there as a resource. And I think, you know, it's not this is just one example, but actually it's quite common. You know, if you if if and I think it's really what Gar was talking about, too, that 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 actually on the ground, there was a lot of potential if you start believing in people's I think it was. Maybe it was Andy that was talking about a sort of slight arrogance on the part of DSA people that don't, don't take enough, um, don't really believe in the capacity of, 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 of activists and, and therefore are looking to this rather seductive sort of stirring from the top through electoral politics. But I think if we, I don't know, it, it, we have to start from that belief in, in the creative capacity of working class people. And that means there will be forms of struggle and sociality on our streets, you know, and that we need to listen to and build on that. And so I think we need to move away from the, not only from the seductive moment of electoral politics, but also from an equation of, of transformative politics with mass mobilization. Uh, and, and we've got to pay more attention to that base activity. I think this is something that Leo Panich and Sam Gindin would always be emphasizing, the fact that we are, in a way, having to start anew uh, with popular organization, working class organization. And that means building on what forms, what bonds already exist. And I just a final point in relation to Patrick. I mean, I've always been an advocate of electoral reform, but all your points about reform I think make, make us need to go back to the question of the basis on which the left, um, the material basis on which the left can effectively campaign for that. And that's where I think this embeddedness is important that purely campaigning for electoral reform, obviously, and you wouldn't say it was, isn't sufficient. It has to be rooted in a much more, a much stronger material, um, sort of belief in systemic change. Anyway, there's lots more to say, but I'll stop there. All right. Um, well, we have about three minutes. So I think that what we should probably do uh, is have any of the panelists, you can read the questions that have been submitted uh, and rather than have me read them out loud, which would take up the rest of the, of the time, you can address those if you'd like. Uh, and I, I would like to very quickly pose one question which perhaps can take us, can bridge this session and the next session, but was certainly a matter of, of urgent concern when I was working on the Sanders campaign. Um, that, I, I mean, I think there are, 
there are two things that haven't come up yet, but that are essential if we're going to be thinking about uh, democratic socialism at, in the heart of empire. Uh, and that is the power of anti-socialism uh, and the, the, the weight that uh, hostility to socialism would have in the event that uh, Sanders had been elected, that Corbyn had, uh, had achieved a, a, a governing majority, um, and that it, we can think a lot about structural solutions um, when what we have in front of us is a problem simply, I mean, that all of these things are products in many, in, in, in one way or another, the fact that there aren't enough socialists to uh, deliver electoral victory for us at this time. So there are structural problems, but there also is just a matter that the views that we have are not majority, not held by uh, viable electoral majorities. And there are many people who are quite hostile to them. Uh, with a great deal of power that they can that they can muster. There are various sources of that, different forms that that hostility takes. Um, but if we're thinking about organizing in the heart of empire, then we have to think, I think, about both of those uh, challenges. And I would be curious to hear responses from any of the panelists uh, to that set of problems or to the ones that are posed in the chat. Um. Who wants to go first? I, I'll go if, if it, that's all right. Um, yep. I mean, I think one of the reasons why I, I, I listed um, fighting white supremacy and having an anti-racist, uh, uh, strong anti-racist platform as part of a socialist project in the United States is because um, anti-socialism is largely equated with like a racial integrationism, like that there is a, a communist ideas and and all uh all kinds of like you know labor reforms and shit are almost always equated with uh, a dangerous integrationism and an upending of the racial order um it's it's even i mean when you see any fox news stuff i mean like it's like anti-police black lives matter socialists want to do blank right i mean like these things are are very closely attached to one another uh, and I think that the the salience of like the the, uh, uh, the amount of purchase that they get is based a lot uh, often about um, about how people see themselves in a racial order, right? Um, and, and view the like relative privilege or whatever they get, um, at least in terms of being able to comp, uh, what do you call it, compete more effectively in the labor market, right? That, that, that that's what their currency is right there. So, I, I mean, I, I think, yes, it is a reality that there is an anti-socialist, uh, anti-communist, um, you know, thing out there. But I mean, this, it, it, it's very racially embedded and it's also, um, it's more often than not based upon exposure, right? I mean, it's like so often, you know, people are very fragmented and they're not able to, to interrogate these ideas and, and be able to see what they are. So, I mean, at least I have confidence that, um, yeah, there's some people who are just like reactionary, but there are a lot of whom, you know, they're just responding to the idea of something that they've never actually had to interrogate in real life. Yeah, I mean, my only uh, additional contribution to that, and I agree with it entirely, is, um, I mean, people get labeled this regardless. I mean, and I think that it's particularly true in, in, in the particular way in the electoral dynamic that takes place in this country. I mean, I read a piece in the New York Times this morning about um, the particular toxic brew of people who are behind the assault on the Capitol. And the set of ideas, I mean, this should come as no surprise to anybody, but the set of ideas they've got are just kind of insane. Um, I mean, they, they're deeply afraid of Kamala Harris because she's going to turn this country socialist. Um, and, you know, it's just so out of whack with reality that it, one of the consequences of that is that you might as well be a genuine socialist and advocate for it because you're going to get denounced as one regardless. I mean, if you're going to advocate for, you know, racial justice or anything else on the spectrum of, or the set of things that we care about, you're gonna get labeled with that um, uh, denunciation. So, and the same is true for, you know, being a spoiler, I mean, or any of that kind of thing, where if you're gonna be an insurgent, um, 
Bernie Sanders was labeled as a spoiler within the Democratic Party, even though he was, you know, completely behind backing who, um, Hillary Clinton and then Joe Biden um, and all his supporters similarly. I mean, these sorts of epithets are used to denounce people and, and discipline them. And I think that we basically just got to say, we're no longer afraid of that. Um, we're not gonna, we're gonna be labeled that anyway. And we have to recognize the way in which electoral politics in particular in this country, the way they're carried out uh, makes us susceptible to that. And that we, we shouldn't like be so cautious about advancing um, a set of demands and an agenda that you know we embrace the thing. And, I, and it, it's encouraging to me, I mean, putting on the positive side of things um, that there are so many people who are increasingly supporting socialism. So, I mean, it goes to sort of what the, a kind of contrast between Mike's comments and Pete's in which the, you know, positive and negative are in the eye of the beholder. And it's sort of like, is the glass full or glass hem empty? And then what, what is the positive that you wanna build on? I mean, for some people it's like the negative is, well, the labor movement is dead and, and you can't do much there and look at what's happening in the electoral arena. For others, it's we'll look at the limitations of the electoral arena and all these great strikes that are going on and protests that are going on. I mean, it, in the end, it, it, we got to figure out what we can build on and not worry so much about um, what we're going to be labeled um, by doing so. Hillary, last word. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree very much with what Patrick just said you know, building on what, um, on the positive. And I think, you know, what I was trying to stress is the importance. And what I was in a way recognizing what you're saying, Patrick, is that we, there is a, we are a minority, those that, that sort of actually believe in, in socialism, but that that can only be overcome, but partly by propaganda and argument and so on, but also by actual experiences of, um, the values that socialism is expresses experiences of of solidarity of democracy i mean in britain there isn't um or in the uk you know because i'm very much a believer in the breakup of the british state um so uh, it, here there isn't in a way there is not quite such a powerful anti-communism anti-socialism as there is in the us it's there, but there is you know a, a kind of in a sort of latent reactionary consciousness that was mobilized very much against Corbyn. And it was to do with um, a sort of reactionary patriotism. You know, so he was easily in the second election, I, you know, labeled as, you know, a terrorist, as, you know, sort of anti the monarchy, etc. Uh, and then there's a sort of class, you know, we've got a very strong, as you know, class system so that there's a kind of aspir a sort of false aspirational sort of attitude that is that wants nothing to do with 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 people in classes below you. So in a way, Corbyn was identified as somebody that was pro people on benefit, or you know, he was not. He was sort of seen as somehow representing the losers kind of thing. Uh, I know that language of the losers is more a US thing, but th there's an element of it here in class terms. And in a way that you can only counter that by, on, on, with vis-a-vis -vis the patriotism thing, by actually building other, uh, building notions of democracy in which there's an identification with locality. I mean, I remember I used to work for the Greater London Council, which I was describing as being abolished, you know, and was very popular. And there, I'm sure that experience, you know, actually eliminated or displaced a sort of belief in the monarchy and in Britain. You know, there was a real identification with London. And similarly, Peter could talk more about Scotland, you know, there. I mean, I don't think it's not that people are saying off with her head, you know, sort of kill the queen, but but there's not um, a deep sort of reverence towards the, the monarchy. And and you know, I think that that it's the exper building experiences of different kinds of democracy that don't equate democracy with parliament and the monarch and so on. That's really important. And similarly, in terms of countering racism and anti working class attitudes, building of local solidarities that make, you know, those alliances, not just political alliances, but day to day experiences so that 
racism doesn't sort of have an echo, nor does anti-welfare benefit sort of um, sort of instinct. So I just want to emphasize that building of actual practical experiences. And, and there's a lot there to build on in the way that Patrick, in the positive sense, whereas the Labour Party, I mean, Starmer, just to give you an example, I was stunned. He tweeted uh, the fact that um, um, the Duke of Edinburgh and our Queen have been in vaccinated against COVID. He tweeted this news and he said, wonderful. I mean, you know, he's no need to do that. It just shows a kind of, you know, feeling that he has to show that the Labour Party is pro-monarchy, you know. And anyway, that's just a sign of how bad things have got. Well, I think the point about building experiences of socialism in multiple contexts is a great place to, to end. And I want to thank very much our panelists, Patrick Barrett, Hilary Wainwright, and Andy uh, Cernetinger for participating in this really stimulating discussion.